man, is this thing on? Guess what? It's time again for another edition of VoIP and Tell VUC, the VoIP Users Conference. A lot of people help us out at the VUC to produce these things, and simwood.com is one of those folks we would like to thank. Turning developers into telcos with their leading API, simwood.com. On the hosted PBX end, we've got onsip.com. Those folks, Junction Networks, have been around for a long, long time, and I've been with them for many years, personally, our company, and also the VUC PBX. Don't forget about zipdx.com. David Frankel's also been a longtime member of the community. He contributes a lot, including the fantastic zipdx.com conference bridge. You've heard of Oxbone.com, and they are responsible for our local rate dial-ins in something like 48 cities. So if you really must use the telephone system, go for Voxbone. And you may well laugh, but you know, <laughs> that's the wrong recording, because I have a new one for September, and we are on the eve of September. Diana, we are pleased to have you, and here's your little intro with openvolte.com. The site just opened today, and I recommend everyone immediately bring that server down. Come on, go over there, openvolte.com. Diana, welcome back to the VUC. Are you muted? Clearly. Take your mute off. Uh, hello, Randy. There we it's go. nice to be back. Diana, you and I talked a little bit about um, these technologies, and what I would like to do, unless you want to go someplace else, there's a question for you, first of all, before we get into the technology stuff. I would like to know how you even got into this kind of work in the first place. Would you mind telling me about that a little bit? In telephony in general or in Yate in general? Even before Yate, how did Yate come about? I mean, how did you even get into technology or the interest in technology that flies here? So if I do this once in a while, it's because there's a fly. How did um, you get into the technology? It's a very long story, but shortly yeah. I started to use a computer when I was 12. So I guess it was always the case in... in, in, in uh, the technology was always there, so I guess it just happened. What uh, what in technology um, interested you in particular? Mm, I'm just very much into computers. That's all. Science. It's you like astro uh, astrology, <laughs> astronomy. No, <laughs> it's just no. it's just a computer thing. I just oh. like computers. Okay, and what was your first language that you learned? Oh dear! Uh, computer language, not language. Yeah. Not actually. Um, well, it was on the first computer I ever used, which was um, a Z80 clone. There which are several made in Eastern Europe, and um, the default programming language there was something called BASIC. Yes. Did you get so into assembly, assembly language or machine language? Yes, I did. Are you good at Z Z80 uh, assembler? Because that was my first language. No. Okay, so I can beat you at one thing. Next subject. <laughs> Kayaks. Did you notice that the event on the the uh, Google Plus event had a kayak? Well, of course, sort of a kayak. I don't know. Did you see that? Yes, I've noticed that, and I was wondering what's up with that. That is a kayak, isn't it? I think it is. Or is it? A yes, kayak? totally is. It. Okay, so you see that we're paying attention here. Okay, we should probably get to the actual topic. You want to talk about Yate, you want to talk about open, however you pronounce it, Volte. Open Volte. So I'm going to start talking a bit about Yate and what we are doing with Yate li uh, lately, and then I will um, I will start talking about Open Volte. Okay. Does it make any, uh, is that okay for everyone? That is absolutely perfect, and I'm sure everyone will nod now along in unison, James, Andy, Bob, you see? Carl, you're not nodding. I'm not. Ken, Ken's not nodding either. Okay, go ahead, Diana. My video's hung. 
Um, so one of the biggest changes that uh, happened in the last year and a half in eight, uh, it's actually related to JavaScript. We got the JavaScript compiler within eight. Um, the reason why we do that uh, has a lot to do with uh, the fact that traditionally eight was uh, always a very good platform for building custom cu custom based applications. Um, and um, we decided that it's the time to, to have an easier way for the users to build them other than um, having to use a, a state machine outside, the, uh, outside of V8, like we used to do it in the past. So we decided to have a default language for V8, and we had to choose between Lua and JavaScript. So we went for JavaScript because there are more developers out there that know JavaScript rather than Lua. Um, and at that point, I had to make a very difficult decision. Are we going to use an existing JavaScript compiler, or, or are, are we going to write our own JavaScript uh, uh, machine? And uh, we looked around, and we discovered that there wasn't any JavaScript um, uh, implementation that was suitable for our, uh, for our needs. In our case, we needed uh, something that would be multi-threaded, and something that would be um, available on all the platforms where Yate runs, including iPhone and Android. Um, and um, we also needed something that will be, um, that for which the build system will be uh, easier to use, will be decently documented, and so on. And we got to the point of um, spending some time with an existing uh, JavaScript machine, which didn't w work very well for us. So we decided to write our own, uh, our own thing, which we did. And now we have a JavaScript compiler within E8. Now putting that together with the fact that we have a, an XML library within E8, I, I guess by now we can make it a, a browser. Um, that was meant to be a joke, but <laughs> I guess nobody is laughing. <laughs> Sorry, I was elsewhere. So I missed your little joke. I think we're all muted as well. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, um, what what happened is that um, we spent a huge amount of time in uh, getting the the JavaScript working properly, because one of the things is that meanwhile we also spent a huge amount of time continuing to develop our SS7 implementation, uh, including. Um, mostly the mobile part of SS7, like Camel and Map on, and all the others. And mapping that together with the fact that we have a JavaScript that allows us to build very easily uh, mobile, um, uh, mobile network applications, which got us more or less into OpenVolte, because uh, we discovered that um, there is no convenient implementation for uh, Volte the traditional, um, um, the, the standard Vault Im implementation, and I'm, I'm going to post the link. I'm going to post it bo both on the IRC and on the Google chat um, to make a, a, a reference in this case. Um, one second. Let me guess, you're going to drop in the Wikipedia link, right? Absolutely. I think part of um, what I, uh, when I spoke to Diana the other day, I myself am a little confused. I, because we don't have LTE here in France in a big way, and my carrier doesn't do it, so I wasn't that familiar with it. But in fact, uh, I, you know, people are talking about IMS and all that. I think we need to give a quick definition, a quick, not a definition, but a quick. Um, Survey of what this all means, and by the way, I would love to know in the various on the various continents. And uh, James, you might want to chime in on this, or somebody else as well. Uh, what the implementations are of LTE of LTE out there, because there's not going to be any VOLTE or Volta without LTE, obviously. So, Indeed. what? How are? What's this? What's the landscape of LTE? Here in France, I think there's only one or two operators. They're just starting it out. And you, you know, in, equipment. Go ahead, James. Yeah, in UK, as of this week, we now have three. So this week, both Vodafone and O2 Telefonica launched their LTE services. 
what does this uh, require? Does this require, obviously, I don't think it requires building new towers, but it requires in, equipping new things, right? Well, it's a, it's a new modulation scheme. Mm -hmm. So a new kind of bearer network. Um, and uh, the oldest operator here in UK, Everything Everywhere, uh, are using refarmed 1800 megahertz spectrum. Uh, the, and uh, O2 Telefonica and Vodafone have both go, gone live on new spectrum, which was uh, auctioned earlier this year in UK. And before we go any further than that, we also have to say that phones like the Nexus uh, 4 uh, don't do LTE. And in fact, the new X doesn't do LTE as far as I know. The iPhone, to my knowledge, the the 4 that I have at least doesn't do it. So what phones even do LTE, by the way? I mean, well, you know, the iPhone 5 actually does do LTE. In but, Europe? Uh, uh, in Europe? Uh, yeah, on the 1800 spectrum. Okay. So yes, it does. It really it has an LTE radio in it as well. Only thing is, it's defeated. And 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 I I didn't mean it. In fact, I said Nexus 4. I meant the X, which is coming out, or maybe it's the Nexus 4 actually, which um, is has been discounted. It's down to 200 bucks, unlocked. Yeah, that's that's the Nexus 4. It actually has it has a uh, an LTE radio in it. It's, it's disabled by default, but there's a, oh. a commonly available thing, something you can do. Uh, without even rooting it, that will turn that radio on. Oh, okay, that's interesting. It doesn't interesting. do you any good in uh, in the U.S. or at least uh, for T-Mobile customers generally, because the radio is on the wrong band for that. But in Canada, it does work with uh, a Canadian carrier. Okay, so before yeah, we this, sorry, this is a two-part challenge. The first part is uh, getting a radio that actually operates on a band which there is LTE. The second part is then engaging the modulation scheme, the LTE modulation scheme. So two parts to it. And and before we get back to Diana, uh, just a quick question, James, to you, which is, so what percentage of the market is ready? I mean, I've got an iPhone 4, so I'm out. Uh, obviously, someday I'll buy another phone and it'll do LTE. What percentage of your market is, is can even do potentially can even potentially do LTE right now? Um, so I would guess. Off the top of my head, something like 10 to 15 percent, something yeah, like that. 20, so I'm, I'm up. Yeah, um, so uh, a fair slice of the top of the range, most modern smartphones do it. Okay, so and I've, the I've, the rollout. I mean, when will we be at a, at 80? Let's say you think it'll be two years, five years, one year. Uh, Telefonica have to cover something like 98% of the UK population by the end of 2014. It's a, one of their license conditions. Okay, but what about the, the, the availability of phones? I mean, the, the existing market of phones, when will we be at 80% where 80% of the people who even have a phone will be on LTE and that their operators will be on LTE? Anybody have an idea at all? Well, if you uh, the, 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 the Mobile flips over about every, what, 36 months, something like that. So, mm -hmm. and, and LTE handsets have been available for a year. It has to do with how often people turn over their phones, but I, there are an increasing number of devices out there that are open. Okay. So, and I don't know if that's you, Michael, but there's some talking coming in. So, I will, I will just say this. Back My co worker. My my coworker in uh, here in US, uh, she actually has an LTE phone and she actually uses LTE every day because San Francisco is covered by by the the LTE AT and T network, and I think Verizon also has that and Metro PCS also has Volte. So is T-Mobile lagging everybody else in uh, LTE? Code? No, no, I think T-Mobile also has uh, has LTE. Let me. I I actually posted a link to all the networks that um, have been doing LTE. T-Mobile seems that roll out um, uh, roll out that in March 2013. Uh, T-Mobile is progressing it. They refarmed a lot of their spectrum mm -hmm. uh, in order to be able to do it and. Uh, uh, they're also aren't they in the process of buying Metro PCS, or did they buy them? I'm not sure about that, but uh, in any case, they're they're all doing it. Sprint's doing it. So this, so all of this, uh, to to uh, resume this to a couple of sentences, all of this is coming up soon. 
and that's kind of why we're here to look at what what for now is a little bit the future of this. So back to you, Diana. Um, we were talking about we're talking about LTE penetration. We're talking about open Volta, and now we need to come back to what you're doing. Um, I will comment a bit on on the on the previous discussion, and I will say that um, LTE it's the today technology. It's basically the fastest growing trend out there because it's the technology that did manage to win in front of WiMAX more or less for the, the carriers. Um, and it's the one that actually gets deployed and it's the one that is going to get deployed in the next two years. Is WiMAX dead? Is WiMAX, um, is WiMAX worth uh, pursuing or is that dying out, by the way, in your opinion? I don't think it's dying. I think it's going to be used in a in a very different way. It's not going to be used um, within the phones. You don't you don't get WiMAX in in the phones. You get LTE phones, but you don't get WiMAX phones. And I should also probably post a list of um, um, LTE capable phones. Yeah, I've got that here, but I'm trying to work out how to. Uh, I've pasted into, uh, and I'll try to incorporate that into things that refer to this, uh, that this hangout. But um, in the meantime, you know, fine, go ahead, and I will try to collect all that stuff. So LTE, WiMAX. The next thing is uh, really getting to what you guys are doing with Open L Open Volta. So I'm going to start with the briefing uh, with the briefing within the LTE technology. Um, LTE is different from the 2 and 3G because it, it lacks uh, the support of a circuit switching, which means um, there is no voice for LTE. Um, basically, every single phone out there, except two or three, are doing um, just uh, LTE uh, LTE data. It's all, uh, it's all data. That was something that I learned uh, talking to you the other day, by the way. So LTE is nothing but data, and anything you want to do with voice is is VoIP over is voice over LTE. Every uh, Volta, right? Yes, yes. No, Basically, it's VoIP. It is VoIP. It's actually SIP based, and it also uses diameter for authentication, authorization, and, uh, and billing, and a bunch of other services. And that technology has been standardized by 3GPP. Um, and the 3GPP idea about how Volta should be can be found in the first link I, I provided, um, the one with the IP multi multimedia subsystem, which includes the, the, the IMS. So we actually looked to. Since we have a very long experience in building VoIP systems, and we have uh, a long experience in building SS7 systems now, um, we looked at this technology and said, hmm, look, LTE is really interesting because it finally gets rid of the circuit switching, which makes the technology, uh, it should make the technology cheaper, and it should make the technology f more flexible and more available for vendors to, 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 to sell um, equipments for uh, mobile networks. And then I looked at the standard that came out of uh, 3GPP and it was like, mm, this is really complicated. And you know, uh, you know me, anything that is complicated, I just don't get it. See, it's because of this. you didn't like anything that was com complicated. I misunderstood. Well, I don't know no, you. I, um, I was just referring to my blonde hair. Um, so <laughs> any 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 time a certain technology is too complicated, I I just can't get it. Okay. It has to be simple. So we look into that. We figure out that okay, this is way too complicated, and we decided that we understand why people want to have all the features because we need the features. Let's be honest about it. We all want want to have HD voice. We all want to have video. We all want to have a bunch of other features out there. But if it's so complicated, it becomes very difficult to manage um, and very difficult to um, scale and um, very difficult to, to have uh, redundancy properly. 
So we decided to simplify that, still keeping the same functionality. That, that's basically what OpenVault is all about. It's our initiative of implementing Vaulty in a way that will simplify um, the IMS without losing the functionality of IMS. Actually, we are trying to add some more functionality by adding for, for every um, light IMS uh, system server out there that we have. I'm going to make a, a link to our web page so everyone will, will have an idea what I'm talking about. So every uh, light IMS server out there will actually have an SS7 component because E8 already has SS7. So it will work back to back to the to the two and three G network. So on one side, we want to build this um, um, awesome voice system, but then we discover that um, we really like to to be able to put up an LTE network to play with. And then we discover that the same thing that happens with IMS. It's actually happening in the packet uh, in the packet core uh, of the um, of the network. So I will actually make a reference to to that to a new link. We'll try to put these links into vuc.me. You'll see the post for uh, this particular episode. You can look at by the way. You can look at the hashtag vuc. Four, uh, no, four five two. VUC four five two is a hashtag. You should be able to find all the references if you're listening to this by doing a search on that. Me time. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Diana is, is interacting. Diana has posted that link. Yeah, to she's posted the, the Wikipedia entry to system architecture evolution. So, if you if you look to that to that to the first picture. It has all kinds of boxes like, OK, the E node B, it's very simple because that's basically the base station. So you, you need a base station to do the radio to the phone. But then you have all kinds of boxes like the MME, the SGV, the PGV, the APG, PG, whatever. And there are some others like uh, PRSF and a few others. Probably there, there is a crowd there that explains better which are all the different pieces that you need to run a, um, an, um, an SIE. So we decided to get our own solution for SIE. So we're actually going to launch not only OpenVolti, but also OpenSIE. That will, that will basically get all those boxes um, in a single box. But because everyone wants to do roaming, and I'm all for it. Um, we will actually implement the interfaces that are necessary to 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 do roaming for um, uh, for uh, the the data part. So what I'm saying is that not only that we we concentrate on on building the voice part, but we also concentrate on building the data part because we discovered that it's difficult for us to 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 get any kind of uh, access to to a network to play with at least. Does it make any sense? It does. You want to? You want to? Yeah, it makes totally good sense. What uh, What Dan is saying here is that she and her team are totally redefining the SAE and the the Volte architecture uh, as defined by 3GPP, and they're losing something like 70% of all the boxes and simplifying it so that instead of going out to uh, Ericsson or Nokia Siemens Networks or Alcatel, Lucent, and buying, I don't know, 10 to 15 million dollars worth of uh, equipment to make this all work. You just go off and buy a commodity pizza box, slap um, Diana's really clever software on it, and uh, on one box it does the whole shooting match. How, yep. disrupt how disruptive is that? Very, very. See if we have any questions before we continue with this. Anybody on, let's see, ZipDX? Plenty of people on ZipDX. Anybody have any questions? It's a good time to unmute yourself with star six and ask the question. Carl, we will be, we will be. Are there any parallels here between 
what you're doing and sort of like the Open BTS folks? Um, yes, we are actually leveraging the knowledge we got by working with them because uh, their concept about one core network was designed together with us. Yeah, if you're not aware, uh, Michael, um, Diana's team have written the back end services for OpenBTS. And uh, that's what's being used at Burning Man in the Nevada desert right now. And well, I'm going to go back today. Yeah. Um, people were interested, Diana, why you spent such a short amount of time in the desert with Tim Panton before <laughs> running away. But I think I know the answer to that, so I'll answer it for you. It's because you arrived there, turned your bit on, it worked, and then you decided that you wanted to go back to San Francisco, San Francisco to do more work before returning to the desert to have fun. I think it was because she wanted to be on the VUC today, and then she's going to go back, right? Yes. Yeah, um, close. Okay, that's that's none of those things are even close to what really happened. <laughs> Tell us about it. Uh, so what really happened is that actually there is a per there are two people within the Nevada desert that do know how to use E8 pretty well, and actually the Burning Man is using the new JavaScript that we have uh, within E8, and it was so friendly and so nice that they actually learned how to write the entire Burning Man application in about a week. So um, actually it has nothing to do with that. It was just I wasn't necessary. Yeah, you're always necessary, Diane. You're always but, necessary, but, but, and Marcus has a question in IRC, which is, how do you learn about all these systems like what SAE does? Do you have access to those systems for reference? I think, that no. was, I think that's for you. No, but um, fortunately, the um, 3GPP standards are available. Um, also, we got access to a significant amount of documentation on um, other vendors' uh, equipments. And uh, of course, we, we are working closely with uh, the the customers of those vendors because we are yet another vendor. Okay. Any other questions in IRC? You just type them in. I think Diana is looking too, so she will. She might just jump on that question before I even get a chance to read it. Um, so yeah, just uh, to be to be very short. Um, we, we just found a, a large amount of documentation from, from both. We've been interested in both the vendors and also the standards. And with the standard, was very easy because it's available. With the documentation from the vendors, it was a bit more complicated, but, you know, it's... And uh, plus than that, it's kind of normal. I mean, we do not expect in every single installation out there for us to install the entire system. We do expect, for example, to, to install just open Volti within the existing SIE systems. So um, we we don't we don't necessarily want to sell everything. We don't necessarily want to um, be extremely inflexible. Actually, uh, our point of view is to be extremely open and collaborate with other vendors to 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 get uh, happy customers. Okay. One of the sorry. One of the questions that uh, I was asked here is. What does Open Vaulty really do? And I think I know the answer to that. Let me have a go at answering that, and then you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it, uh, it's mainly to do with the handoff of voice calls from LTE back into 2G or 3G as somebody drops off the end of LTE coverage. Um, uh, that's absolutely correct. And actually, I will make a reference. If you look on the design page, um, the handover is actually called SRVCC. So I'm going to make a link to, to our design for SRVCC. What, does, it, what does SRVCC stand for? That's a good question. Let me Google it. <laughs> SRVCC. You know, in my world of 3G and strict 3G, um, my uh, carrier switches to Wi-Fi every once in a while when it finds a Wi-Fi signal that is that belongs to them, and in fact, it's extremely irritating because you basically you lose connectivity. So if I'm on Square, uh, not Square, if I'm on Foursquare or something like that, I have to kill that app and go back into it. I know what or, VCC or turn, stands for. Or turn, uh, um, just a second, or turn um, turn Wi-Fi off. So I'm wondering about the. 
the pass, the uh, handover, handoff, right? The handoff from LTE when you move into some place where there's no longer LTE, it must be pretty painful. Um, actually, the standard says that it needs to happen in less than 0 0.3 seconds. Well, what you understand that what I'm saying is that I'm talking data now. So I'm on a website or on a thing, something, an app, something that is using data, uh, and the data just drops, and then you're, the app thinks that you're not even connected anymore. Now I don't know if that's interesting to you because you're, we're talking kind of about VoIP, actually voice. I'm sorry, but in the app world, that kind of sucks actually because you have to go. The user has to make a change. In fact, if I was just someone who didn't know anything, I wouldn't even be know how to do that, and I would be I would be pretty much dead. It would look like I had no in internet connectivity, and apparently. This may be an iPhone thing, by the way. Apparently, uh, if you start another app, now you're on Wi-Fi, and it knows that, so it works okay until you switch back to 3G, in which case, then it loses connectivity again. I wonder if LTE, I wonder if LTE addresses that. I would assume that it would, because it's newer. It tries to, maybe. But um, this is a problem, as far as I'm concerned. So um, I will mention this. Uh, first of all, when you move from LTE to, to 3G, you are moving within the same carrier. Um, and the carrier, the, one of the major reasons why people, re, why carriers are actually using LTE is because they can set up the what is called the bearer. They can say, what's the priority of a data packet? Okay, uh, That's one thing. And the second thing is when you do the handover between Wi-Fi and 3G, you have two issues. First of all, you are doing a, a handover from a Wi-Fi that is not controlled by the carrier, right. and the carrier doesn't know about it, and the 3G in general has a longer time for establishing a new connection. So anyway, it's going to take longer. In the case of uh, moving from LTE to, to, to 3G, because it's in the same network and because the carrier controls both networks, um, what's going to happen the, is that the handover is going to be way faster. First of all, you just move from one radio to another resource within the same network, mm -hmm. and then it's just a it's just a matter of the network uh, negotiating that and um, ma uh, making the phone aware of the fact that it did hand it did a handover, which is one of the things that mobile carriers are really good with. So I don't think that's going to be an issue. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens the day that I get LTE. But uh, that was one of the problems that I've seen. LTE seems to be so a technology that looks at that kind of a problem, though. So that may go away. Yeah. So one of the one of the things that I've been actually extensively working on was how to fill how to fix the handover to work properly between uh, between uh, Open Volte. And uh, and an existing 2 and 3G network, so um, w there are different scenarios in which uh, uh, use it to to make a handover between a 2 and 3G network to toward an LTE network. Uh, the traditional IMS, and again, um, please uh, take take a look on the on the design uh, page that uh, for a, a SRVCC. On our website, the the default uh, IMS actually uses uh, SIP proxies. So traditionally, within the within Volte, the RTP goes directly between the UE1 to UE2. Within our network, within Open Volte, the RTP always goes to to the server. So one of the things is that when you do a handover, you don't need to do a handover for RTP. You don't need to change the media from uh, UE1 to um, to go to the uh, gateway. Sorry, from UE2 to go to the gateway. Traditionally, the RTP will go between UE1 and UE2. Um, and uh, if you do a handover, you will need to switch the RTP from U UE1 to an uh, to 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 an SS7 gateway, does it make sense? I'm sure it does to somebody. Uh, I want to ask you a question related to all of these. <laughs> Bob is Bob Bowles is saying so much homework reading to do after this VUC. Good thing it's a long weekend. I agree with him. 
uh, I tried to read a whole bunch of things. Diane, I want to ask you a question about, because this is a carrier orient. You're, you're looking at carriers here. This is not an end user issue where people can just download uh, some software and they're, they're doing what, you know, open Volte. Um, can I ask you, and I don't know if you're able to answer this, you don't have to mention any names, but how do you approach carriers at all? I mean, you have to find someone to communicate with and go, okay, here's what we're doing. Are you interested? Or Talk a little bit about that. It's non-technical, but I'm sure you know something about it. No. We are in this space since ever. We, we've been always selling to carriers. Y2 was built as a, as a carrier-grade uh, uh, soft switch with a lot of uh, uh, c custom application support. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing that for years. So you're already, you're already talking to all these people, but for example, you and I were talking the other day, and I, I mentioned our carrier, and um, I'm just wondering, how is there a channel where you can get to these people who are building a network now, basically on 3G? They were, they were uh, using someone else's network in this country, and they just were created. There's a long story behind free mobile, but we won't get into that here. Um, is there a way to talk to them and say, hey, uh, this is what we do. Are you interested in this? And can we work together? Is that what you're we, doing? Kind of, or how is that we expanded? Did not, we did not work with Free for their MVNO solution, but I can tell you for sure that we did an MVNO in Germany, um, which is Sibgate. Sure. So we did, we did pretty much what Free does in France, we did in Germany. Free is actually an operator. They have their license to be a direct. They're not an MVNO, as far as I, unless I don't well, understand. Well, they're half and half. Actually. Yeah, they're half and half. They're using Orange's uh, super uh, infrastructure right now, but they are building their own equipment. So they will eventually become an operator. They are, as far as the administration goes, they're licensed as an operator. And I want to get you in there, so I'm trying to figure out how to do that. And I haven't talked to my friend yet who's in the telco industry, but when I do, I'll find out if he knows anybody. Anyway, moving on. So, um, yeah, there are, there are so, so, several ways for us to, to talk with different carriers. Mm -hmm. And we are actually actively doing that. And so well, one of the things is that... Okay, um, what I can tell you is that Free Mobile in France did acquire a 2.6 gigahertz spectrum in 2011 for LTE. That's good news. They, they've been fighting. I don't want to talk about Free forever because we want to talk about what you're doing. But Free has been fighting, and that's, that brings us to another question, which is uh, the actual situation of carriers. Because... You deal with carriers, but carriers have their own battles to fight on their own in their own countries, right? With all these yes, but, yes, but that's, that has nothing to do with us. No, but you suffer the arrow slings and arrows arrows of um, to quote Shakespeare of um, whatever uncertainty or whatever it is when when there are when they have problems, they are not able to. Uh, do what they want to do. So they might choose you and like what you're doing, but they're licensing or whatever, you know. James is making funny faces. Do you have a comment, James? No. Uh, just, you know what I'm saying, though, right? That it's all political. There's a lot of political stuff, commercial political stuff. So, I mean, here at the VUC, we can talk about all this stuff like it's all wonderful, but the, one of the problems that everyone has is that there are licensing issues and that there are there are problems that go way beyond what is the best technology. So anyway, enough of that. A parentheses closed. Yeah, so um, we know about those problems, but uh, we also discovered that, <laughs> oddly enough, uh, one of the major reasons why uh, carriers do not deploy Volti is because it's so complicated. That's one thing. And the second thing is that there are no easy ways of doing SRVCC if you are using IMS. So the thing that we actually did very differently is that since we are keeping the art, if we are st always staying in the LT within the media path because we do not use a C proxy, um, 
what's happening is that we can actually reach that target of 0 0.3 seconds when we do a handover. Okay, a little bit of explanation here. The SRVCC is single radio voice call continuity. This is where you hand off from one medium to another, from one UE, from one telephone. And the reason you want to do this is because LTE is not everywhere. And likely as not, you're going to drop off the edge of LTE. And the last thing you want if you're a, a big operator is for your calls to drop. So you've got to hand off between the different technologies. Uh, and that means uh, handing off the call from LTE into either 2G or UMTS 3G. Uh, and that's what SRVCC is all about. It's setting up the signaling in the back end through, in this case, through the Yate SS7 component so that um, you're bringing up the, uh, the new uh, voice channel and then handing off the media to it. Uh, and as Diana says, she's doing that in about 0 0.3 of a second, which is pretty fast, which is fast enough so that you don't really notice it happening as an end user. Is that, is that about right, Diana? Yes, absolutely. That's pretty much what uh, the 3GPP uh, is asking for when they talk about SRVCC. Yeah, and the big problem for carriers is that the cost of buying the hardware and the complexity of achieving uh, SRVCC is enormous. It's expensive, it's complicated, it gives people brain ache. Uh, and so what Diana's done is come up with a simpler and considerably cheaper, like two orders of magnitude cheaper way of doing this, which is why we love Diana so much. Among other reasons, yeah. Okay, I don't know what <laughs> you're guys talking about. <laughs> That's because you're a lovely person, Diana. But uh, No, it's incredibly clever. It's very bold. And uh, if you've got shares in Ericsson, uh, Alcatel, Lucent, or Nokia Siemens network, but networks, sell them now. So um, actually we didn't necessarily try to do this in order to make the other vendors unhappy. The only reason why we try to do this is because we leverage our uh, VoIP knowledge for so many years and said, look, those servers should be equal. There is no real reason to have a server that does a bit of proxy and the next server that has a different bit of a proxy. I mean, if you look at IMS, it's actually the leverage of the existing uh, SS7 networks, which has nothing to do with VoIP networks. It's basically just trying to get SS7 concepts and make them into SIP. Yeah, and ring, ring, ring fence them so that people can't muck around with it. You know, one of that, and it, that leads me on to one of the other big advantages of using the gate type in infrastructure is that it's much, much easier to get in and bolt on all the VoIP type stuff that uh, the VoIP community has been using for, for a number of years because um, Yate in its basic form, it, it's, it's open source, isn't it, and, um, Diana? So, um, you can get in, you can change bits and pieces, it's easier to interface bits together, whereas if you buy it and go out and buy a traditional 3GPP proprietary solution, you can't do anything with it, apart from keep on paying the very large maintenance fees. So now you know why I really like Tim Panton. <laughs> hey, Diana, let me get my camera back on here. Um, are there things we haven't covered we, because we're, we're 10 minutes to and we, we have all the time in the world. We could, we could spend five hours with you if you want. But the most important thing really is to make sure that we've said everything that needs to be said. Are we close or not? So I'm going to mention a few a few things that uh, probably are not obvious for those that are not necessary in the carrier's market, but I'm going to say this. Um, the VoIP traffic is uh, continues to grow, but the prices for that uh, VoIP traffic are actually going down. Mm -hmm. So what's really, what's really happening is that carriers are actually making less money, um, theoretically speaking. Practically speaking, since it's a flat and people are not getting cheaper flats, at least in US, that's not necessarily true. However, in Romania, for example, you can buy like 
a thousand minutes with four euros or something like that so there is no real gain in selling minutes however whoever owns the spectrum owns the last mile the last mile is the term used by the internet service providers so uh, I don't think mobile carriers actually care if they if they carry voice traffic or data traffic so what they say is that the voice traffic is bringing them less and less profit even if it grows but the data traffic actually brings more and more uh, income because uh, customers are very savvy for 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 data so I, I think in general um, carriers do want to have LTE and I think in general carriers do like data and I don't think they are really willing to buy something that is so complicated that ends up being even more complicated than uh, the SS7 network because that's just it doesn't make any economical sense and uh, what's happening out there from from what we know is that the other vendors are bringing such a su su such a complicated infrastructure that even um, that, that, that it's even impossible for the carriers to manage. What we want to do with OpenVolti is to empower the carrier to have his own technical team again because one of the things is that most of the mobile carriers cannot even have their, their technical teams because their network became too complicated and they are relying on vendors heavily. So we want to allow them by providing an either open source license or a, or, or a license that allows them to, 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 to see the source code under a, a, a private version of uh, OpenVolti. We want to allow them to build applications again, to become what, what they were supposed to be in the first place, the, the companies that are bringing innovation within the market. Uh, is is OpenVolta going to bring something new and exciting that we haven't thought of yet? I mean, is that possible? But the way it works. I, I I will just mention this. Um, on top of op Open Volti, you can have the the SIP application servers because Open Volti is going to be compatible with the 3GPP standard for for uh, application servers to interact with uh, with uh, um, with uh, the Volti platform. So what's going to happen is that you're going to see very fast a bunch of companies being able to actually get applications within their mobile networks. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I can totally see something like uh, an app store for mobile carriers networks. It's interesting because our um, the same ISP that is our carrier on mobile um, has a set-top box for TV and I mean they've got apps. I haven't really looked much at it and I don't really want to go there now but what I'm saying is that Everybody's got apps on every level of all these layers of communications we have. So apps are definitely something that need to be thought about. Um, well, let, me, let me see if Carl Fife has any questions. And of course, he has a special intro if he does, but he needs to wave at me. Oh, he just dropped out, apparently. He either doesn't or it was a coincidence he dropped out. Anyone else have any questions for Diana before we start to wind down? I think Diana's point about apps is a very apt one. Yeah. Um, in as the revenues generated from the traditional means, that's minutes and SMS and, and the like, drop, the, um, the carriers are looking for new ways of generating revenue, and and applications are clearly going to be that way of uh, doing it. And rather interesting here in UK. Um, Vodafone, who launched yesterday or the day before with their LTE network, they don't say anything about their LTE network at all in all of the advertising, but they, the, the advertising is based around Spotify and Sky um, Sports applications that they're giving away for free. So they're, they're saying that the, uh, the big differentiator for Vodafone is that you get these applications for free don't say anything about the quality of the network at all because the network's totally transparent. I mean, it's almost immaterial. It's the apps that are going to sell the service. When is this uh, going to become apparent to us, all of these questions of uh, Open Volte and, of Volte and uh, the rest of it? When are we going to be exposed? The average person will be exposed to this when? 
One year, two years, five years? Less Most than likely five. in a year. Yeah, less than five, certainly. Yeah, More like one year? So, um, so right now there are like three different mobile, mobile carriers that already have Volti. Metro PCS is one of them in US. Another one is the, the one in South Korea. And there is another one, but I forgot where. The, the truth is, a mobile carrier usually makes a decision with a, to buy something with at least two years before. So the time when you actually get to see the service means that it was already tested and verified for at least a year. Because otherwise you cannot deploy it, obviously. Right. And Volta is something that is new enough that is going to take quite a while for carriers to get their uh, heads around that. So um, I will expect something like two years, quite for most for most networks. What I do know for sure is that it, it will happen. And the, the real question is, who can actually provide such a such a technology to the point that will actually help the mobile carriers um, to bring some new services and to position themselves better on the market? Like, for example, this Hangout. This Hangout does. I, I can totally hear it better than I usually hear a mobile phone. And that's happening because it has HD voice. And HD voice on 3G was was a nightmare. It's difficult to implement. Nobody is actually using it. Nobody actually has it. Uh, for Volta, it's going to just be there. Mm -hmm. And then people are going to be much more uh, open to do uh, probably video and video conferences like this one. And the requirement to do a video conference on a, an embedded device like a phone is that you actually need to have a conference server. For example, this Hangout probably has a has a conference server, but uh, a video conference server. But um, a small carrier w will not be able to afford the same the same amount of money that Google spent into into Hangout. But they still want to compete against uh, against Google on the same services because they see that some of their um, s s some of their market is basically disappearing and they become commodity ISPs. So in order for, in order for them to not become commodity uh, like any other ISP, they they will have to compete on services. And uh, the only way for them to do that will be um, to to have an infrastructure that will help them with that. We live in interesting times, as they say. Let me remind people of the URL before we go on. So that would be openvolte at, uh, sorry, openvolte.com, O-P-E-N-V-O-L-T-E.com. This site just opened today. Thank you, Diana, for allowing us to announce it. And let's make another call to, oh, wait a minute, I see Carl Fife. Hold on, hold everything, hold the front page, hold the last page. Uh, Carl Fife may have some questions. So the question now is, Carl, do you have any questions? You'll have to nod. Is he even hearing us? I'm not sure. Are you unmuted, Carl? Carl, are you unmuted? Do you have any questions, Carl? He's looking all confused. It's scary to me. I'm, I'm a little afraid. Carl, can you hear me? He doesn't look like it, does it? He doesn't look like he's hearing me. Huh. He's changing. He his... All right, hold on, because Carl, Diana, Carl will have some very. All right, Carl, can you hear me now? Yes. No. Oh, no. he's not here. He lost his complete internet. Carl is a very important questioner. He well, he can probably wa wave a question. question. Huh? Sign language, a question. Yeah, sign language. Uh, uh, <laughs> what's the word for that already? To mimic the question. No, what's the name for that? Uh, Carl, can you hear me? Semaphore. Just type it. No, there's a... Semaphore. There's a name for that. What is it called? It's you... a signage. No, you Sign play a game. Carl. Not if you can hear me. He can't hear anything. Oh, my God. Wow. Charades. Thank you, Lauren. Yep. <laughs> charades is what I'm... So do the charade of the question. <laughs> that would be brilliant, wouldn't it? After all, we have video. That's almost an anticlimax, having Carl yeah. lined up. We can see him, but we can't hear his question. I know, it's horrible. Carl, wait. He's We're looking confused. Here. Dan Lane is on ZipDX, too. Dan, did you have a question? Go ahead. We're waiting. Otherwise, Carl, come on. 
No, he's not hearing us at all. All right. Carl is a lost cause. Does anybody else have any questions? I'm going to call on Bob Bowles, just, if nothing else, just to embarrass him. Bob, nothing? No, you got nothing. Carl just put it on his headset. Or he, all or right. He Carl, can you hear me? Yes? No? Can't hear. So what is he hearing if he's not? What has he got a headset? This is compelling audio, folks. <laughs> Jerry, I know you have a question, Jerry, about LTE and uh, open voltage, right? I, no, you don't. I think we're all in the same boat, Diana. We admire you for pushing the envelope. And other than James may be the only one who knows anything about this stuff. I think Diana's marvelous. She, uh, so do I. And uh, you're going back. You're going to kayak back to to uh, Nevada soon. It's Nevada. It has no water. Yeah. So that's true. <laughs> You'll have to do it in the sand. What? Oh, it has water. They just hid it behind a giant concrete structure. Yeah. When I arrived. When I arrived in Las Vegas so on Sunday, it started to rain, and it rained for two days. <laughs> That's yeah. bad luck. <laughs> the, the, every, everybody said it's because I'm from Britain. I brought it with me. Could Pretty be. likely. <laughs> Could be. They kept telling me this never happens. <laughs> it does. It does. Actually, I did catch like a few rains, um, especially last time when I was in Vegas. Uh, yeah, I did catch some rain. But what yes, what were you doing in Vegas? Playing poker? No, I was at IT Expo. <laughs> oh, IT Expo, yeah. That's a that's a bad way of spending time in Las Vegas. <laughs> well, it depends. Depends what you want to do. But anyway. <laughs> Randy asked a, 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 a re reasonably interesting question, which was, um, how will Volte affect the end user? And you know what? That's an interesting question, because um, Volte is there in just about e every LTE system right now. It's just that you don't realize it, because if it wasn't there, you wouldn't really be able to make voice calls with VCC that hand off. Well, it's not really. It's actually the the voice call is actually made over the 3G or 2G. Or 2G. So I mean, yeah, it has to be said there are a number of different ways of achieving Volte. Uh, it's not just one solution, but there are different solutions depending on how much money you've got to spend. And if you're Metro PCS, you went for a very, um, well, a cheaper version of, of Volte um, as they went for a cheaper version of LTE as well. By the way, all LTEs are not equal. Uh, LTE can be employed in narrow band, medium band, or really wide band modes, and depending on how much spectrum you've got. And if you haven't got a huge amount of spectrum, which of course Metro PCS haven't, then you employ it in narrow band mode. So, so how does that work? Let, get into that a little bit. Um, so I'm talking to you. You know, how? What's the negotiation on that? Well, it really depends on how it's configured. Um, you can set uh, LTE up to use as much or as little uh, spectrum as you have available within within bounds. Is uh, it going to change depending on that? I mean, he, let me let me set the framework here. You've got you've got a handset which is capable of uh, X Y Z A B C you know things. Now, not every handset will be capable of all codecs, right? Or will they? I don't know. Maybe they. Maybe there will be. Well, well, it, well it's not so much codecs as uh, mod modulation schemes on the okay. radio. So, All for right. example, when you're out in the countryside, you want something that gives you maximum range and penetration, but uh, perhaps not so much capacity because there are many fewer people. Whilst in the town, you only want to go a short distance, but you need a huge amount of capacity um, to deal with the loads and loads of people that you have wanting to share the. Uh, uh, the bandwidth. So, um, different modes of operation in different places. So, what, but what, what is negotiating that? Is that under LTE, under a Volte, or under? No, no. That's oh. uh, that's normally the way the network, the the, the LTE system is planned and deployed. LTE. So, it's a, it's, a, it's a network planning and management thing. Okay. So, um, that's what, that's happening a lot on the radio side. All things being equal, 
uh, LT actually covers less of a range than, than 2G and 3G. So for quite a while, we're not going to see a, a, a large deployment of LT outside the cities. Yeah, that's, so, a, that's another good question that I was that I didn't ask, but I should have. Which is, uh, that's exactly right. Uh, radio frequencies, radio bands are act differently. So you're going to be in an urban area, basically. Some density, population density, is necessary for that. Yeah, right? yeah, but bear in mind that in many places, like here in UK, you've got 2G and LTE services sharing the same spectrum. 2G by 2G, you mean edge? Uh, yeah, GSM oblique edge. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Or GPRS edge. Correct. Yeah, yeah edge being two and a half G. Yes. Because so, to, to be clear, just one second. Be clear. If you're just as far as your data use, if you're just checking your email, edge actually is pretty much sufficient. Assuming no attachments and you're not watching any particular thing come through. If you're just looking at email and chat and using IRC or chat of any kind. Uh, including the iPhone's ability to do messages instead of SMS, uh, basically Edge is quite a bit, it's quite fast enough. So that degrades nicely. Go ahead, Diana. I look like you're chomping at the bit to say something. <laughs> Go. Thank you, Randy. So um, yes, bandwidth is one issue, but the second issue is how fast things do happen. One of the things in LTE is that an LTE is capable of doing a handover way faster for data. Yeah. So uh, um, even people that live in the countryside, or even if you are in the countryside, you might be you might be in a car. It's very likely that you're gonna be in a car. Uh, and the handoff from one base station to the next one is gonna be way faster. Um, I I believe that the not only the cities but the roads are gonna be quite fast covered because it makes uh, it makes economic sense for people to be able to drive and have high bandwidth uh, and to have faster uh, uh, handoff between uh, handover between between base stations totally off the wall comment here wouldn't it make sense for the road which someday will be wired for Google's type of uh, auto driving cars wouldn't it make sense for the telephone the telephony network James is smiling because maybe yeah. I'm well, sure I'm not the first yeah. one thought of this, but uh, actually uh, the technology should be on the road and not in towers. Towers is ridiculously inefficient, isn't it? Well, you don't know how close you are to the knuckle there. It's, I think I am. As, as, a, as a UK... My mama uh, didn't raise any fools, James. An initiative uh, just about to be kicked off by the Minister for Transport here in UK, um, which is aimed, interestingly, not at roads, but at railways. Okay. Uh, improving uh, mobile communications on railways because they're not particularly good at this moment in time and so there's a big chunk of money floating around to do that and uh, your suggestion about embedding the uh, transmission lines in the road is yeah very close to uh, what I think is going to happen so we're going to see transmission lines along the, the railways that trains will pick up and uh, and you'll have both Wi-Fi and LTE, and possibly 3G as well, on board trains. And I will make a comment about the, the US market here. There is an initiative called FirstNet. FirstNet it's a, it's a US agency for first, not re, for first responders like uh, firefighters and policemen and so on. And uh, they don't have really good communication. So what um, the U.S. government is trying to do is uh, basically giving for free spectrum to uh, you, to rural carriers in U.S. to install LTE um, and uh, to allow free access to to allow uh, as a highest priority uh, first responders access within the, those networks. Yeah. So we're going to see at least in US a bunch of really small LTE networks. And those people are, are honestly asking, OK, and what are we doing for voice? And what are we doing for data? I mean, OK, fine, we can buy an E-Node-B, because there are a bunch of companies that are selling an E-Node-B out there. But where are we getting the data? Uh, data um, uh, the SIE part from, and where are we going, going the getting the voice from? And that's where we're trying to play. 
Yeah, what we're seeing um, in UK and across Europe as well at the moment are a whole raft of initiatives aimed at filling the not spots, so the places where comms don't work. And in, in many cases, as Diana said, in the, in the States, they're going to give away spectrum to people to encourage people to do this. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? And another yes. throwaway comment about LTE as well. LTE is, is more spectrally efficient than 3G uh, and 2G. So you can get more bandwidth and more reach for the same amount of spectrum because it's a more sophisticated, more advanced modulation scheme. So uh, it's just more efficient. With the cost of not being able to reach as far as uh, the 2G and 3G. Well, you say that, but it, that really depends on the, the spectrum and the mode in which you're using it. And in most cases today where they're deploying it, it it's in built-up areas. So they're going for wide um, bandwidth, um, short-range deployments. But it is possible to operate it in narrow band, um, goes a long way type modes, which incidentally is where, how the bulk of Metro PCS LTE is deployed because they, uh, they don't have a huge amount of spectrum and they have to co cover large areas. So, um, so if you look at the deployment of Metro PCS's LTE, you'll find out that they don't have a huge number of towers, but they're covering a very, very wide area, albeit thinly. Um, that's uh, that's absolutely correct. The, the 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 only real issue is that even if you have a much better spectrum, uh, as in a lower frequency, uh, in US at least the frequency is 700. Um, you still cover far far less range than the 2G the, than the 2G. 3G it's a different story. But I think what's going to happen is that carriers are going to deploy uh, side by side both 2G and, uh, and LTE for quite a while. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's quite clear that carriers are going to put both LTE and 2G on the same piece, bits of spectrum that they've already got. There's a certain amount of spectrum refarming going on. So as the demand for 2G spectrum drops off, uh, they're going to reassign chunks of t what used to be 2G spectrum and put LTE on there. Diana, um, this has been fascinating and a lot of people have been, compla have been complaining. Complaining. <laughs> have been commenting. No, on the contrary. Have been commenting on IRC that this is one of the better DUC sessions. I'd like to think they're all good, but in different ways. But I want to know if Carl Fife can hear me and he's ready for his close-up. He's yeah. not, not... Okay, and you are you unmuted, so Thanks. I would... Do you, you don't have a question, though, right? Well, I, uh, my question is... Oh, okay, wait, 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 hold on, 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 here it is. And now, here's one final question from Carl Fife. Although the words one and final are not contractual, so here's Carl Fife with a series of questions and sub-questions that may or may not be possible to answer. Take it away, Carl. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Randy. <laughs> so my question was, why did my my headset stop working during the most interesting part of the call? That was my question. That was the question that didn't need an intro. Okay. Well, I don't know. I I um. Any of us can help you there. I can help. I mean, I can. I definitely have questions. I. I however, what I can't promise is whether or not it's. You know that, that you haven't already answered them in the other parts of the uh, in the other parts of this uh, of the call. Didn't hear, yeah. Yeah, that's why I didn't hear. So, so at the risk of um, sounding stupid, I'm going to ask um, about about Volte. So, so Open Volte, if I understand correctly, is putting uh, is basically allowing. So let me just back up again, again. So, so, so Volte, like unlike unlike uh, 2G Voice, where the Voice is, you know, lower down the protocol stack. In in Volte, you're actually moving up the protocol stack and moving it into the application layer. Voice is in the application layer instead of way down, in you know, really close to the to the bare metal, as it were. So, and so you're basically wrapping VoIP in in an, in yet another layer. Um, and so the idea with, and, and correct me if this is wrong, the idea with with Open Volte is to actually allow Yate to function as it looks to it looks to the network as a as a UE is that what's happening 
as a, as a piece of user equipment? No. So what's really happening is that <laughs> is that um, uh, you write about uh, uh, Volte being VoIP, basically. Mm -hmm. It's just voice over the IP network that uh, LTE is. Okay, so that that's absolutely correct. Yep. Um, what's happening with uh, uh, Open Volte is that Yate is actually um, Open Volte is based on Yate. It's a modified version of Yate for the particular market of Open Volte. Okay, maybe I didn't make that very clear. This is for this is for deploying Volte within your very own carrier. So if you wanted to build a wireless voice network from the ground up, you would use this, but you'd have to have your own transceivers and your own everything. This is not about interoperation with Volte, carrier Volte that is being deployed. It is about interoperation with, uh, with the existing uh, uh, Volte when the roaming will be available because a carrier has to be capable of doing roaming with some other carriers. Uh -huh. uh, in the same time, Open Volte was not necessarily uh, <coughs> developed just for Volte. So um, it will be available to be used for Wi-Fi carriers if they will be interested in doing so. Uh, it will be interested in uh, basically working with any kind of a lower layer data structure that exists out there. I see. So in other words, um, because LTE is essentially uh, just a, a, a data, uh, just a, a, a network type on which IP can run, therefore on which any IP application can run, such as voice, um, you are offering the same signaling and uh, call handling and handoff and roaming capabilities so that in, in, uh, if somebody wants to interoperate with, uh, with a Volte user, piece of Volte user equipment or, or, or a Volte carrier, you can do that with any network type, whether or not that's uh, <laughs> you know, an office Ethernet or, 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 or Wi-Fi or some other network. Is that, is that right? That's absolutely correct. And one of the things that really mobile carriers really want is to get rid of femtocells. And the reason uh, why they want to get rid of the femtocells is because the user is unhappy to have a femtocell at home because mm -hmm. it pays like 200 bucks or whatever. Yeah. And the carrier is unhappy because the carrier usually pays like 800 bucks to, to get that femtocell. Mm -hmm. I see. So, so you, they the have to amortize that cost over a long period of time if they want to recover. Yeah, I think one of the exactly. problems, one of the reasons why they, they don't like them is that they can't really do the VCC, the voice call com, uh, continuity between femto cells yep. and the rest of the macro network. And a big chunk of what um, OpenVolte is about today is uh, controlling this VCC function so that you can hand off between different um, bearer systems. Um, but yes. having said that, I, I can see OpenVolte actually evolving into something that does a whole raft of other things as well. So some of these more advanced applications, um, and uh, Diana touched on conferencing and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I can see OpenVolte evolving to do a whole load of other stuff as well. So, so I think a good comparison to OpenVolte would be something like UMA, where T, where, so UMA was, uh, was T-Mobile's um, uh, T-Mobile was a big pioneer of this, but basically they they would um, put a UMA client on your on your mobile device, and then your mobile device would um, communicate with a virtual would communicate via Wi-Fi to a virtual base station, which was accessible on the IP network. So so the so the mobile device was functioning exactly like a GSM client, except instead of being on the being on the you know the uh, the TDMA GSM network, it was just on the IP network, but it was yeah, indeed, transparent. Yeah. yeah, UMA was effectively GSM over Wi-Fi. Right. So OpenVolte is similar to that in into where it fits in the market niche. Well, it's the, a little bit different in that it's it's not the the bearer mechanism, um, but it's the bit that controls the handoff of calls and the applications running on multiple bearer systems, if that makes sense. I so what James is yeah, trying one, to one, One's encapsulating uh, an, another protocol, and in this case, 
the encapsulation is not necessary because yeah. it's native. Absolutely. It's native and, and, and the clever bit here is that the Yate back end bit already has the SS7 map pieces yeah. that are required to talk back into, to signal back into the legacy uh, 2G, 3G world. And uh, so, uh, Sorry, Diana. I'm sorry, James. What I'm trying to to establish here is what makes Open Vault so so freaking special. What makes it so special is that we have both the technology of Vaulty and we have the technology in 3G, which allows us to stay with one leg within the 3G network and with one leg within the within the um, uh, Volta network. And giving that Volta is yet another SIP. It's a far, far more complicated SIP, and it needs to have all the control that. The, the mobile carriers actually need, but it's still SIP. It's a superset. Yes, it's a superset of SIP, like C++ versus C, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. But in the end, it's still it's still SIP, which means that it can still be used by other type of carriers. Yeah, absolutely right. It's SIP, but with the ability to interface back using the SS7 map into other systems. And I can see mm -hmm. some interesting applications, like, for example, an LTE carrier uh, having a, a partnership with a 3G carrier and doing a handover, uh, just uh, 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 j j just by, by default and all kind of different type of applications. Like, one of the things that we will be capable of doing is, for example, authenticating the LTE devices within an existing HLR yes. without the necessity of building an HSS or building a completely different uh, new s new core network. So what's really happening in LT is that uh, opposite to the the difference between 2 and 3G, so that when the carriers move from 2 to 3G, they still had the SS7 network and they still had the same core SS7 network. The change right. between 3G and 4G is huge, it's massive yeah. within the core network because it changed every single bit of it. Right. And so what's happening is that that's extremely... Media route optimized point-to-point -point IP network, so you don't have to send your call all the way back to some obscure okay, tandem okay. in Florida just because that's the way that the billing was set up and some crazy old school method but of routing that, calls. That, that's one problem, but the second problem is that within the traditional SS7 networks, they look like a sterile... Uh, still a st star type of a network. Yeah. So what's happening is that if the MSC for San Francisco goes down, there is no other MSC that will be available to, to take the phone calls. So basically San Francisco is going to be down as long as MS that MSC is down. Uh -huh. which did happen in the past to the mobile carriers a lot. Uh -huh. What we are trying to do with OpenVault is that since every single server out there is equal to the next one, in the worst case, you will have to just reboot your phone and you will still continue to have service. Uh -huh. um, the second part is that we are, not, we are trying our best to not force carriers to have a network in a certain way because every carrier is different and he, it has his own challenges on his own market which are extremely different mm -hmm. so we are trying to be extremely open on the, the, this is why I've mentioned that we will try to allow the, the carriers to authenticate the users within their existing HLR so they don't have to build a completely back-to-back -back database for the HSS um, the next thing is that carriers already have certain services for, for CAMEL. Since we do stay with one leg within the 3G network, that, will, that means that a CAMEL service from an existing uh, uh, 3G network will work with, uh, with an LTE network and will be able to uh, provide, provide services. Does it make any sense? I, I don't fully follow that. You're, what's the term you're using, CAMEL? Yes, uh, camel is C the part C of SSL. C A M E L, like like the animal. Yes, yeah. it's a protocol. It, it's a subset of uh, SS7. Ah, gotcha. Okay. Uh, for signaling purposes, principally for it, well. And we, a subset of camel is hump, I would assume. <laughs> and, and and because of that leg <laughs> back in, uh, because into of that leg. the because of that leg back into the 2G networks, I'm I'm very curious. Um, or 3G networks. Is there some level of um, analog and or um, 
opportunity with the open BTS community here? Sure. Yes. Well, um, Yate is already running the back end of open BTS now. Um, and Diana and David Burgess have been working together for what, 18 months, Diana? How long have you been working quite, with quite David? Quite a while. Quite a while. Quite a while. And that is why Diana is located now in San Francisco, because of David Burgess. Kill all no. about about well, well, not, What about TOE? What about TOE? I don't know. TOE. What is TOE, first of all? Yeah. Behave yourself, Randy. What, oh, I didn't get a joke here. Yes. So, so, he, so this is a, this is a question that seems like a, a, a you know a, a direct follow-on. So, so basically, most people, most mortals, can't erect their own base stations physically, and they don't have FCC licensing, etc. But you know, this Open8 allows you to use some other network, some other network layer, whether that's just wireless, vo uh, wireless. Um, uh, Ethernet or uh, Wi-Fi, whatever. It also st stands to reason, therefore, it seems that you could essentially do open Volte over LTE data, like over the top. So you know, like I can do, I can do, I can fire up my mobile device, 3G, 4G data radio, and I can register um, a SIP user agent to my own SIP server, right? So I'm doing that over the top, and the carrier knows nothing of it. They don't know, you know, whatever. They're they're not doing packet prioritization based on the application, et cetera. But but it stands to reason that even if I am a Verizon customer and I am using Verizon LTE, and and if I pick up my phone and just dial, I might even get Verizon Volte. Could I not use a product like Open Volte within Yate? To do an over-the-top call using OpenVolt on LTE, Headache. do you understand? Migraine, migraine. Right, I know it's crazy, but it, but the idea would it would be it would be essentially working around the you know in other words if I want to call if I want to make a call to Romania on my on my Verizon telephone call the the um, the, the 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 carrier is going to charge me something greater than the customary rate because I'm in their captive um, in, the, in their captive. Universe, uh, because I'm a captive customer. But with Open Volte, it seems to me that I could basically make an over-the-top call using the data network without, perhaps, without the benefit of packet prioritization, in order to bypass the carrier's billing. I think absolutely. Altogether. Yeah, Carl. I think you you sussed it. You, as usual, you've gone straight to the uh, one of the big opportunities here, which is to yeah. allow. Um, services to be run across multiple bearers. So when you don't have anything else uh, other than AT&T, you use AT&T, but when you've got Wi-Fi, which is much cheaper than AT&T, then you use that. Uh -huh. Or, or sure. if you've got uh, white space, um, then you use white space, for example. And, oh, and right. what, what OpenVolte allows you to do is to knit the whole lot together as one coherent service. Okay. So, Diana, so, do you have a follow-on? No, I, <laughs> wait, 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 I, have a question. I have a question here. Okay. So for 20 euros, a, for 16 euros a month, that's $20. We have unlimited dialing on our mobile network. It's 3G, but uh, the 3G, forget data, voice. We have unlimited calling to 110 countries. So... What do I care about the rest of this stuff? Well, it's not necessarily about billing, Randy. It's about, I mean, billing is one component of it, and certainly in some markets, uh, the carriers are more likely to be beating up their clients. But it seems to me that, you know, you might want to have, uh, you know, you might want to basically bring your own, you might want to sort of bring your own priorities, you bring your own carrier. In other words, you might have a carrier that would give you some other benefit or some other feature like, Coders or voice or uh, you know voice coders or, or or I don't know like some I don't know some kind of routing or some kind of um, I don't know I'm just trying to think there's there's yeah, got to be voice, yeah voice calling is just one application but there may be a, a whole raft of other applications in fact wideband voice calling is another application yeah yeah um, which is better better than narrowband voice and some <laughs> people might pay a little bit more to just get at the wideband. 
So you can say, oh, Carl, you're terribly narrow band this morning or something like okay, that. Diana so, has to leave in a couple of minutes, and I don't, uh, see, her, I don't uh, see her video here. I don't know if you guys do. Yeah, your video has uh, gone, Diana. That's because I turned it off. Why did uh, you turn it off? Because I'm packing. I need to go to Burning Man. Okay. <laughs> Diana, let's say goodbye to Diana. Diana, thank you. You know, we, we really do appreciate your coming to us. Um, um, I met you at MooCon years ago. You, you're an amazing person, no, seriously, and you're a real person, and that's why you have an enormous success whenever you join us. Thank you so much. Very talented. Thank you. Diana. A real person. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Diana. We'll be following what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, where's my crowd sounds? Okay, wait a minute. I will say something about over-the-top services about LT, though. Go ahead. Okay. Over-the-top services have been trying to conquer the market for a long time. We all know that. Mm -hmm. Okay? That didn't happen. And the reason why that didn't happen is that because whoever owns... I know, James, that you're going to hate me for this, but wh whoever owns the spectrum is the one that owns the money. Yeah. It is what it is. I'm not trying to have an opinion about that. You know that. OTT, serv OTT services generally uh, work over over terrestrial networks, right? I mean, OP OTT services. There's basically such a such a, um, uh, a a surplus of bandwidth that you know you can do almost anything over the top on uh, commodity you know commodity bandwidth, right? So will those market dynamics find their way down? Downstream or upstream, however you want to look at it, to wireless carriers. I mean, obviously, it's always been they've always wireless carriers have always been resource constrained, and if you have um, and if you have a, you know a ten to one increase in in, in capacity uh, when you're when, uh, in something like you know uh, LTE advanced, well then suddenly a lot of those resources are no longer so tightly constrained, and OTT services suddenly start becoming a lot. They sort of start to they 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 cease to kind of break the, the, the normal forces that uh, that make the carriers want to control them more. Do you so have this any is exactly about that? why w this is exactly the reason why half of the LTE it's actually handling with type of service and quality of service and better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I doubt that mobile carriers will allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the mobile carriers are going to protect their market and they're only going to allow prioritization of their Volte, not your Volte, not OTT Volte. Well, they've got to be careful because there are um, bits of legislation that protect people. So the carriers can't just do what they want. They can't deliberately degrade uh, their competitive services, for, for example. Because of course that, they can. That, that, well, they, although, they, although they did that in this country when, when uh, cable first started. Technically, they can do that, but that's uh, an abuse of significant market power. And uh, they'll end up in court if they try that. So, uh, James, in Romania, Vodafone charges you three more euros or so a month to allow you to use Skype on your mobile phone. Yeah, well, that, well, that's Vodafone, uh, Vodafone Romania. And uh, but if they try that here in UK, um, somebody would end up in the high court. I'm pretty sure of it. But ultimately, that's pretty interesting. I mean, if they're going to allow you three dollars a month to do Skype, then essentially what they're doing is saying we're going to we're going to charge you three dollars a month to do packet prioritization of uh, of your application. And I think that that is I think that that's fair. I mean, I think that. If if uh, you know if it's one thing to say our network is constrained and so therefore we're going to charge more money to the people who need uh, higher quality of service, it's another thing to say our network is ample and we're going to penalize you. That's different. But if they're going to essentially prioritize your 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 application, that seems like huh, that seems like uh, it, it, it seems like something that is not so far fetched. You know, but I but I'm guessing the the idea is that that ceases to be necessary when you have ample bandwidth and you know in the, you know as is the case in terrestrial networks. Yeah, I think packet. Sorry, guys, I, I need to run. Okay, thank you, Diana. Okay, Bye. thank you so much. We hope to hear. Thanks, from Diana. You soon. And since our main guest, we're going to continue this in the.
Well, I'm going to have to go. I'm, I'm missing my, my wine tasting on the train, even though this has been a particularly fascinating session. It was, and I thank everybody for participating. We're going to do the music out, and if you guys want to stay on and hang out for a couple of seconds, fine. But we should go to this. No routing tables were corrupted during this edition of the VoIP Users Conference. Also, IP communications and VoIP on Google Plus communities. Thanks for staying. VUC.me is the address on the web. VUC.me slash live. Interested in watching the videos? James. Very often they're what are you zipping? So you gain by watching them. Our thanks to Simwood. Simwood.com. Onsip.com, our host at PBX for the last several years. ZipDX.com, the fantastic, full featured, full color, wide band, Zip conference server. And Voxphone.com for the 48 local rate dial ins. See you next time.